Professor Brendan Hicks from Waikato University. Um, Brendan's a fish biologist and a freshwater ecologist. Over to you, Brendan. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to talk about a project that I consider is um, uh, crazy and ambitious. Um, and uh, anyone doing freshwater work, I think, uh, is pretty crazy and ambitious when you see some of the weather and some of the challenges we have to deal with. Um, I'm very fortunate to have been involved in, in this project um, uh, and the principal uh, uh, worker in this particular part of it is, is Ian Kusabs, uh, who's a private uh, biological consultant in his current role, but he's been a student um, at the University of Waikato, PhD graduate, and, um, and uh, John Quinn in the audience here has uh, been a supervisor, and, um, uh, and uh, uh, Ian Duggan and uh, Kevin Collier are on this, uh, the same project. Um, and so what we've investigated is the use of a traditional Māori harvesting method, the tokora, for monitoring freshwater crayfish uh, in streams. So some background here, this is a project 2.3.2, um, uh, Whaka Wātiatea, uh, Riha Rawaho, uh, Māori solutions to biosecurity threats and incursions to Tonga species. And, and our aims are to look at the interactions uh, between non-indigenous species, um, uh, principally fish and tongue or invertebrate species, um, many of, a couple of which probably serve as ecosystem engineers performing keystone roles in freshwater ecosystems, and to also um, determine uh, interventions in, in accordance with Mataranga Māori uh, that we can use to sustain and protect Tonga species. Um, and the, the species that we've got in question here um, are uh, the Kora, freshwater crayfish, and Kayo, the freshwater mussels, and I'll be talking about the, uh, the Kora today. So um, Kora, the freshwater crayfish, we have two species in New Zealand, um, one in the North Island, Paranephrops is the genus, and they're widespread in lakes and rivers. Um, and uh, this uh, example is one of the few applications of Mataranga Māori um, in freshwater to make quantitative estimates of freshwater ecosystems. Um, the, so the tow kora, which is shown diagrammatically here, um, has uh, fern bundles attached to a line that's deployed um, usually in a longitudinal uh, direction from shallow to deep, at least in a, in a, in a, to a sample kora in a, in a, for, for, for um, a quantitative estimation. And this was uh, Ian Kusab's uh, PhD that he uh, finished in 2015 and uh, and led to uh, quite a nice uh, publication um, that described the technique. So the, uh, so the fern bundles there, um, the uh, whakaweku, whakaweka, there we are, um, are tied to the taokora and it's got a uh, panga, a weight at one end, and a teva, a tumu, at the, um, at the shore end. So kaura were historically a very important to Māori. And, uh, and I, I love this diagram for just a piece of history for the, the um, individual traditional fishing grounds that were staked around uh, the shoreline of uh, Lake Rotorua uh, and used by, uh, by hapu living around the edge of the lake. Um, and, uh, you know, it's extraordinary density, really. I mean, every sort of patch of uh, uh, lake edge there has somebody's claim on it. Um, and uh, today the kaura still exist, and they're a delicacy and a Tonga species. So, and here's a, another a wonderful shot of um, uh, the Whakaweku being transported out to the site for deployment uh, by Waka um, around 1900. Um, this is in the Okeri Arm of Lake Rotuiti, in the Central North Island Lakes. So, how do we begin this process? Um, the good thing about this is that the ingredients to make the uh, Whakaweku are everywhere. Uh, and they're in scraps of waste ground. So bracken fern, um, uh, particularly disturbed sites, Tridium esculentum, uh, grows uh, robustly, and that's actually quite important uh, because um, uh, Ian tells me that the end of the season, like the sort of March to April um, fern, is much better than the early season fern because it's uh, nice and lignified and tough and dry and will last a nice long time in, in, in fresh water. So, um, so these are cut and then they're tied into bundles with cable ties, uh, 10 or so fronds tied tightly together. And that tightness is important so that they stay together under water, but also to make a nice tight uh, brushy um, habitat. 
So um, uh, we use this method to establish some guidelines for sustainable harvests of kaura in the Tiarua Lakes, uh, which we published recently. And, um, and Ian now has a, a, a contract work with the Bay of Plenty Regional Council to sample and monitor kaura in Central North Island Lakes. Um, so he's using this technique regularly in 12 lakes. And his mean catch is uh, 20 to 60 kaura per whakaweku. And that weighs uh, 200 to 800 grams in total. Um, so it's a very effective technique. And because they're basically caught unharmed, they can be returned to the water. Uh, so it's a very effective monitoring tool where we don't want to, um, uh, to harm the organisms. So the process is that as the toe uh, is lifted out of the water, there was a whakaweku attached. So to make sure the, the kaura don't jump off, we have to have some sort of device underneath. This is the kaurapa, which is this vaguely coffin-shaped uh, piece of uh, canvas that um, is, is eased under the, um, uh, the whakaweku as it's lifted on board the boat. And, uh, and then the kaura are shaken out and, um, and counted and returned to the water generally. And um, this shot this here shows the tail of one of the kaura. And Ian has a nice video that shows that the kaura really hang on. Even as they're coming from the bed of the um, lake to the surface, they tend not to jump off, which would be a, quite a reasonable kind of research question, I would think. So, um, so they were, these, these whakaweku were used traditionally in Tiaro and Taupo lakes to, um, uh, to, to fish for kaura, but also to fish for, um, for fish species as well. Um, in other di districts, they're known as uh, koeri or taruki, and, um, and they were used to catch kaura and elvis, tunariki or puraho, uh, near waterfalls, uh, so describes best. And so this motoranga suggested that the whakaweku might have um, a, a place in sampling uh, kaura uh, for fish, uh, but also the question is, um, could they be used in streams and rivers? And uh, this was a, a subject of a... Um, of, of a Niwa, an MB funded Niwa project that, um, that Ian participated in. Uh, so things like the common bully and uh, koaro uh, are plentiful in lakes and, um, and of course uh, eels in, uh, in, in, st in streams and rivers. So the problem with the karapa is that it's quite a large, relatively cumbersome thing to start carting around if you're going to be carrying around fern bundles and this um, this piece of uh, machinery to kind of harvest. So Ian devised um, a piece of uh, shade cloth strung between two broom handles and um, uh, made his uh, uh, basically a little pole suspended piece of net that then he could handle with one or two hands. And uh, here's the sort of size of it by comparison of one of the whakaweku. And, um, uh, and here's Ian standing with it, deploying it in the, uh, in, in the stream. So the whakaweku deployment, they can be tethered to a stake put in the, in the stream bed and um, by close to the edge in the middle, um, wherever it looks uh, likely there may be kaura, and, uh, and, and basically left there to soak. So then it's a waiting game. And, uh, and uh, this is Ian retrieving a, a whakaweku, so the karapas downstream, and he simply... Uh, reaches over to the, to the stake, detaches the shark clip, lifts up the, uh, the whakaweku, whakaweku and uh, lifts the hole uh, under, on his, um, his karapa to the stream bed, shakes out the kaura. So it does work. And one test that Ian did was to uh, basically see how the um, length of time affected the catch. And it appears that... Uh, uh, after the first uh, day or two, there's very little catch. After a week, the catch is increasing. And by about the second week, then the, uh, the whakaweku fish efficiently for, for the, then and the, the su successive seven weeks or so until they start to disintegrate in the, uh, in the stream. So beyond about sort of 11, 12 weeks, they're starting to fall apart and the catches drop off. But they have a pretty healthy catch rate in the Tiwara stream um, until that point. Um, and uh, so what, uh, what we did as well was we tried two different streams with and without predators to see how the predator would affect because the predator was part of our, 
uh, assignment with the, um, uh, uh, the biological heritage funding. So the Tiwara is a stable lake-fed um, stream and uh, with no eels, uh, and, uh, but has rainbow trout uh, spawning in it, and a silty substrate with some beds of aladea. The Mangatama stream in the Waikato um, is catchment fed, it floods quite a lot, it has tuna, it has brown trout spawning in it as well, with a gravel substrate, and no macrophytes. Um, and what we did was a comparison of fishing methods to see how well the Whakaweku would perform uh, by comparison. So we used uh, uh, baited and unbaited traps. So the FMT is the fine mesh minnow trap, just a galvanised fish trap that breaks in the middle. The BMT is a vinyl coated black minnow trap, which is the sort of warehouse equivalent that you'd buy for 10 or 12 bucks a piece. Um, the, uh, uh, we used fine mesh fike nets, and uh, here's one deployed. It has a, oops, beg your pardon. It has a, um, uh, a three metre wing and, uh, and then a bunch of hoops with funnels that, uh, that the cora go into to get caught. And he compared that to, um, to nighttime spotlighting, which is also quite effective in some situations. So this is, and we're encouraged not to show uh, an overabundance of numbers, so I didn't. But the pictures, I think, tell, um, tell a huge amount here. The most exciting story of the Whakaweku is their representativeness of the size of cora that they catch. So the, the top graph is the black minnow traps, which is sort of highly biased to the larger, larger sizes. The fine mesh minnow traps, similarly kind of biased to the larger sizes of cora, and the fike nets. But the, um, the Whakaweku have this wonderful representation of the juveniles. So these are the ones that are hard to sample by virtually any methods and the Whakaweku sampled them really, really well. Um, we also looked at um, uh, Kaura and bullies in, different, in the two different streams. So the stream to the left has the predators, that's the Mangatama. The stream to the right, Tiwarai, has no predators, and you can see that the Kaura catches were universally higher in the stream without predators. Um, and the Whakaweku, when compared to the other techniques deployed in the same stream, were were higher, so there was definitely the best sort of catch rates from the Whakaweku. But the bullies were a sort of an exciting surprise because we found that in the Mangatama, this is the one with the, the large tuna wandering around at night, um, had massive catches of bullies in the Whakaweku. So it was a, an extremely useful way of catching and enumerating bullies in the stream. Um, interestingly, where there weren't any uh, predators, the Whakaweku didn't seem particularly attractive to the bullies in the, um, in the Tiwaroa stream. So our conclusions then is that the Whakaweku are an extremely effective way for sampling Kora in streams. Um, there's less size bias than the other methods and they're cheap. So they're ideally suited to use by iwi and community groups. They're cheaper than nets, um, they're natural materials and, um, and they don't require $7,000 of the gear and a team of highly trained electrofishers that the electrofishing does. So our future research then is to um, quantify the relationships between these cora populations and, uh, and, and non-native predatory fish. So we've looked at the native predators and then basically to test the, um, the Whakaweku as uh, habitat enhancement and see whether um, they can reduce predation of cora by non-native fish species. Thank you. So we do have time for questions for Brendan. Any questions down here first? Very good question. And I've, we've thought of both things. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, there would be a pretty you know, continual replacement job. The, the obvious thing is that a lot of these, I mean, in urban streams, Bruce, you would be keen, keen to sort of uh, know the, what happens in urban streams, and we probably do, the, uh, um, we, we go through, or the councils do, and they go and clean all of the sort of brush and things that might be habitat. So, you know, we could give advice uh, on, on keeping some of that habitat there that, that just falls in naturally. So a certain amount of this brush falls in naturally, and we're actually 
managing it and removing it, which is a really quite a poor idea in my view. Um, and then I guess, um, so, so we've, we've gone tentatively down the route of looking at some of the uh, possible um, ways we could make artificial, maybe slightly longer lasting um, materials that might stay there better. But, but again, you know, with the, with the whole sort of, sort of community group and, and citizen science, uh, the fact that it's a natural material that's cheap as chips to make um, you know, is actually a, like a big, uh, a big improvement. So, no, it, would, it wouldn't because of the breakdown. It wouldn't be a permanent habitat solution, but um, you know, but if community groups uh, you know, wanted to use it as, as a monitoring tool, and it would increase the numbers, it definitely provides habitat. So, any more questions? Yes, one down the back. Um, well, it, I, I think there's a bit of a size game going on, and the large males are quite aggressive and predatory, and, and I suspect that um, you know that, that it might actually discourage you know the smaller juveniles from going in, uh, whereas the the Whakaweku provide this three-dimensional habitat where, where it's, it, it's not just a trap, it's also habitat. So the fish, they're living in there, and it's colonised, but it's got the, got the bullies in there, and Kora do eat bullies. Um, it's got invertebrates um, throughout that matrix because it gets fully colonised by bacteria, uh, polysaccharides, and a variety of things. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a food larder as well as a habitat. So I think that's why it's so much better for the juveniles. Thank you, Brendan.